Hello, hello, beautiful people. It's me once again. We're gonna go into uh, the flood part two with um, more details regarding the ark, uh, the uh, animals, um, and uh, the storage, as well as going into details with uh, between you know comparing um, between canonical genesis and the apocrypha as we normally do and so yeah shall we start so before we continue with the apocrypha we will go back to genesis and this time we'll go to genesis 7 king's james version um just to look at you know the details of uh the selection of animals um and how they came into the ark, etc. And then we will look at the same um, list of animals and how they entered the ark in the Apocrypha version. So this is Genesis 7, King James, King James Version. And Yahweh said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee I have seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take the, to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. So what is the difference between clean animals and unclean animals? It will be clarified also more in Leviticus on what is allowed and, not, and what is not allowed to be eaten by Ibrim community. Um, again, Ibrim is the original biblical term for what nowadays they call Hebrew and then and then some other culture refer as Jewish but all of these three things are not synonymous because they sometimes they don't depict the same people but um, they might uh, refer to um, a similar religion but we will go into the details about the um, terminology the meaning and the and all of that on another day because um this is for um uh, specifically just for the uh, the pre um uh, pre-existence of Israel as a nation because the first one to be called Israel was Jacob so it would take a, a few more chapters until we uh, we can call uh, a nation with a name specifically but again, to the term clean and unclean, it refers to the animals who can be eaten. So no, it's not necessarily about um, if the animal is a dirty animal or if it's an evil animal. It, ne it doesn't necessarily say that. Uh, it's simply to differentiate which animals are, are allowed to be eaten because their lineage and their... And their uh, the digestive system allows for a more purified uh, muscle than others because animals with only one stomach then they are don't have um, a filtration system while animals with two stomachs two hooves um etc they're 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 um safe to be eaten uh, because there is purification there are no parasites in the meat um and so he wants to have seven uh, of those. So he, he wants to have more clean animal for, for mankind to access so there is no shortage, shortage of food. And he wants to keep unclean animal for ecosystem, for, uh, for um, basically as furniture in the, in the, in the world uh, that he has intended to build. So these animals, they still deserve life. They still deserve respect. They simply, they're not to be eaten. They have their own food chain. They can eat, um, eat whatever uh, animal has been said to be uh, their prey, uh, etc. but they're not for human consumption. Not every animal is for human consumption. I hope that is clear. It's not a cultural uh, stigma or a taboo. It's simply what is good for you and for your anatomy, for your digestive system. You don't want to... Um, 
just make your life hard. He wants to feed you with animals and plants who are compatible with with uh, with your with your body system. So you shouldn't eat unclean animals because it can then uh, have. Uh, effects on your uh, epigenetics because epigenetic is where when you are modifying your gene num by by lifestyle and eating while genetics is when you are um, interfering with your hereditary system so uh, still it's very, it's very important because you are a product of your environment you see anyways uh of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. Because birds they still have to nest on the on the on the earth, on trees. They spend a lot of their time flying, however they do need to rest and they and have uh, like a, a base point where they also um raise their little um uh, their littles and um, let them grow and and also when they can uh, sleep and rest uh, so obviously he had to uh, put them in the ark because the water was was over even the mountains which means that there was no place for birds to um to sit on on branches trees because they were completely covered by water and so there was no access for them for food so in all of this we understand that yahuwah had to also destroy all uh animal kingdom and uh, also destroy all plants. And you will say, why? Only mankind has sinned. But we saw in other chapters, fallen angels and evil men have started to manipulate with, uh, with, um, and breeding with beasts and, uh, and creating, um, and creating monsters. We remember in, um, even in Greek mythology or Asian mythology, creatures who are half human and also half plants, like the nymphae, the nymphae, or even if you think about Batman with poison ivy, um, and then of course the um, animal hybrids we've seen uh, thousands of times. We talked about also about the folklore uh, creatures like the elves, the gnomes, and all of those uh, creatures who are. Uh, who uh, some of them ha were uh, went to hide in Agartha, so basically in Middle Earth. Others were destroyed in the in the um, in the um, in the flood, and others instead are sometimes recreated um, uh, by by evil people doing evil deeds uh, around the world. So, because people. You cannot think that people are just psychotic and that they see creatures and they just imagine them. How can, if someone, only one person sees a creature, it might be imagination, hallucination. But if a, a big group of people has confirmed they've seen the same creature with the same, uh, with the same elements, you can confirm it simply, it was uh, an, an, a creature not intended by Yahuwah, but it was created for evil purposes. So all of these mischievous little creatures that you hear in tales um, like uh, leprechauns, gnomes, and, and uh, orcs, and gremlins, and elves, all of those things were there at the time of Noah. They were. And so that's why he had to destroy even all animal kingdom because he was uh, ten tempted with corruption. So their blood became uh, unclean uh, with uh, with uh, with um, uh, angel DNA and also uh, breeding creatures that they should never be bred together. Just um, imagine the level of the disgust. Um, and I mentioned previously that those who are in the water water kingdom then a lot of them remained because they were already in the water that's why there are so many sites of sirens or mermaids uh, very scary and um, creatures uh, to be to be quite exact uh, because 
they were not destroyed in the flood. They were already in the water to begin with. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I made will uh, will I destroy from off the face of the earth. You see, there will be no um, remnant. And Noah did according to, uh, unto all that Yahweh commanded him. Noah was six hundred years old when the flood waters uh, was upon the earth. Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean beasts and of clean of and of beasts that are not clean and of fowls and everything that creepeth upon the earth. They went. Uh, in two and two unto the Noah's are uh, into the ark, the male and the female, as, as Yahweh had commanded Noah. So they went into couples, walking, creeping, and and uh, you know flying inside. I think it's very cute. <laughs> they just knew that they were chosen to be saved. Imagine those animals going in in organized manner. Um, it's so cute. Um. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. And in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of the heaven were opened. We spoke about this <clears throat> when we talked about the book of Enoch, that, which is basically the uh, father-in-law of Noah. Uh, and is and and at the same time is also his great uncle uh, was taken into heaven because he was the greatest man alive and he was the first emperor of the righteous people was brought up and the angels taught him about the weather and about how uh, precipitations are brought into the earth and basically about the rain that comes down from heaven into gates and um, different uh, uh, shower heads, let's say, that they are then um, uh, pur purposely um, maneuvered by specific angels every day and for for every hour to be then deciding if it's snow, if it's rain, if it's uh, whatever other precipitation is needed, the quantity, the frequency, uh, the density. And, and then those gates are then uh, closed uh, for precipitation. However, there are also bigger gates uh, at the, on the firmament because there are, the small gates are for normal precipitation. But however, to make sure that the, the, the water went to over the mountain level they opened the 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 the, the gates of uh, the bigger channels on the firmament to allow the waters above to come down flying heavily so it, to make sure they it, there was at least uh, more than 200 percent more water than they normally would um and so imagine 40 days and 40 nights of unstoppable almost uh uh, rainforest rain plus these big jets of uh, of water coming down like um, waterfalls of of water from the waters above, incredible. Um, okay, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and in the self same day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them, into the ark. They, and every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into and they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein in there is breath of life. And they that went in, went in, went in, male and female of all flesh, as Yahuwah had commanded them. Um, and Yahuwah shut him in. And, and all, 
Let me check. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased, and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. And the waters prevailed, and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. It's incredible. Can you even imagine? 15 cubits? It's, uh, whoa. So basically, imagine the highest mountain on earth. I think, what is that? Is it the Mount Everest? Uh, probably Mount Everest. Mount... Everest height Wow, is a <laughs> is eighty eight hundred meters tall. What? So this is the highest mountain on earth. So imagine this is, was even 15 meters above the Everest, the level of water. Me and you, we cannot imagine this amount of water. It's, it's just unbelievable. It's, it's absolutely insane. Um, what Yahweh can do. <laughs> and all flesh died that moved upon the earth. You see the things that moved upon the earth, both upon, not inside the earth, not in the water, upon, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and every creeping thing that creeping upon the, upon the earth and every man. And we saw earlier that Yahuwah gave um, a mercy death to all of the righteous mankind. The relatives of Noah died of natural causes before the flood, so they didn't suffer uh, in the flood like the rest of the uh, of mankind um and again it says upon the earth because yahweh knows that there were creatures um at the uh, antechamber of the bottomless pit th that they went to hide in the middle earth to create a civilization next to their fathers and so those pe those entities uh, didn't die and the same as the sea monsters didn't die all in all, whose nostril was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. You see, dry land on top. This is very specific. Just This is to justify why there are still monsters on the earth after the flood. Because Yahuwah is intended, is saying, only the dry land. So you can imagine how terrifying it was. There were monsters on the dry land. Monsters on the middle earth monsters in the sea it was an absolute nightmare living in the days of noah almost like today you know so obviously because the the level of of, of brutality was so severe he took away the the biggest amount who who were living on the dry land so he took away that part so we can say that at 20% of monsters or an, an, or unclean entities still lived uh, ever after that. So 80% were destroyed on the dry land upon the earth. Then let's say 15% in the sea survived of those that didn't re require a high uh, uh, level of salt. And then 5% survived in the middle earth, hiding in the caves under the crust of the earth. You see, because they did, I remember one time they did find a giant with a bluish or green skin also in a cave uh, that was, I don't know, many, maybe two kilometers deep in Iraq. And then when he came out, he was attacking the soldiers and he was speaking um, a Nephilim language. So basically pre-flood language and it was stinking like death and he had red hair. And he had Caucasian, like Americans say, basically he had European features, but he was gigantic. He was like four meters tall and he had bluish, grayish skin. 
just absolutely absolutely uh crazy and disgusting they would and they basically took uh two soldiers with his bare hands crush their chest like they were they were toys and then he he crushed the heads like literally like it was butter in his uh gigantic hands crazy stuff anyways Every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, face of the ground again, both men and cattle, and the creeping things and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark, and the waters prevailed upon the earth as a hundred and fifty days. So you can imagine that... Those creatures that they live under the crust, because they went hiding in those caves and these big channels of empty space, and they created uh, an, a second environment, you know, with plants and, and an artificial sun and everything else. And, um, you know, you can read the book about, you know, uh, traveling to the Middle Earth of this amazing author um because um it's quite in interesting because this journey depicted by Varn Jules journey to the center of the earth is really speaking about mythology uh, of the Tibetan people that's why Hitler sent so many people in Tibet because it's the door to access Agartha this uh, place that is close enough to the bottomless pit um, they, they could um, speak with um, with their fathers, you see, because fallen angels are very tall. They're like two or three meters tall. They look like um, like a white person, but they are two, three meters tall, and they have really long, blonde, silver um, hair, green or almost transparent eyes, and all of, all of that. And um, so they look like the aliens that they depict on also ancient Asian cultures. Uh, <clears throat> And so, or also the one in the Mesoamerican Me cultures, they talk about these um, these uh, dragon-like uh, god who is also blonde, uh, but then transforms into a human f creature that is blonde with blue eyes. And so every time there is some alien, they're all blonde with blue eyes. Apparently, even the one from the um, I think that is a cult. <laughs> That is worshiping this stuff. Um, the the I think the leader is a a lady. The clones children in Canada or something like that. Um, let me check what's the name of this particular. So this lady, her name is Brigitte Bosselier or something like that. That she likes to clone people in Canada, and her company is Clone Aid. I think the first one they cloned it was nineteen ninety nine publicly. I mean. And she is also a worshipper of called realism or realism. I don't know. Is this ufology religion that they believe in this, uh, basically this alien race, the, these extraterrestrial Elohims, basically the fallen angels that they believe those are the ones who create the mankind. The same thing that they taught, they teach in this movie about Prometheus, the engineers, like this, Entities from space who created mankind, which is basically the the devil deception. The devil says, you are my children, which is a lie and the truth at the same time. The original humans were created by Yahuwah. But a good chunk of the, the population of today does have Nephilim DNA, does have angel DNA. So in a way, yes, it's true. Those are their children. But... They didn't create them this, the way I Elohim does. They are product of of uh, sexual reproduction. So it's not like pure creation like Yahweh does. You see what I mean? And interesting, their their symbol of this this religion is um <laughs> oh my goodness, is like what they say is a David star, but David didn't have a star. I don't know why they put uh, um. Uh, symbol of Judaism, the the Star of David, uh, 
because it's, it's written it's not written in the bible anywhere in nowhere in the tanakh in the torah is written or shown this is a esoterical um symbol that was created in in the medieval times by eastern european and uh, judeo christians movements or esotericism anyways and then in the middle of this david star there is the um there is this uh, symbol a buddhist symbol uh, there is the swastika not to be confused with the nazi swastika right but it's interesting that the symbol of nazism is the same symbol as uh, as uh, asian asian es esotericism you will think that if this was a um, a white supremacist movement they would have used um, a white um a white culture symbol not um east not an asian symbol but because this because Arianism and the worship of of the perfect uh, soldier has nothing to do with human DNA. They despise humans. They are their goal is to achieve perfection by by becoming angels again. They don't want to be human. They don't see any 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 um, um, advantage in being human. So that's why Hitler was a big fan of asian religions because they had um, a closer um, knowledge of fallen angels simply because the door to 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 get to them was closer and so um, uh, because people think oh these uh these people are racist they don't like humans of certain uh, of certain of certain skin tones no they don't like humans period they 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 uh they like only them, themselves, like those who have angel blood, reptilian blood. Um, uh, they don't like anyone that has human blood in them. So they couldn't care less what color you are. If you are human, then you are, you are, you know, disposable to them. So it's interesting that this, this religion has a symbol as the union of two symbols who normally in modern history are depicted as enemy because the star of david and the swastika are posed at the two extreme poles but in these religions they put them together they want to put the the swastika in the middle in the sense of trying to achieve perfection by by becoming angels again so that's why they like cloning and genetic advancement a genetic engineer and use magic because this star is a is a magic symbol from kabbalah so it has nothing to do with torah is uh it's a it's a evil symbol uh, n nobody from ibrim religion like as he is uh, intended and that believes in yeshua ever uses those symbols because they're evil they are used for evil purposes so it's very interesting to just um, think about that right but we'll talk about maybe clonade and brigitte and this crazy religion another day because there is <laughs> so much to go through already it's um it's a trip it is a trip my goodness Okay, so let's go into the book of uh, of uh, Joshua, chapter 6, verse 1. At that time, after the death of Methuselah, Yahuwah said to Noah, Go thou with thy household into the ark. Behold, I will gather to thee all the animals of the earth, the beasts of the field, and the fowls of the, earth, of the air, and they shall all come and surround, and surround the ark. So basically, Yahuwah was sending the spirits to the animals to basically obey Noah and f and go and be near him. So he, because imagine, the earth at that time was as not as as much populated as it is today. So there were parts of the earth that were very difficult to reach, very far. And so certain animals, they were just hearing the calling of Yahuwah to arrive at the spot. And you will say, how did Yahuwah decide among so many? Well, basically, it was taking the ones who, who had the best genetics to then go near the ark. And so then uh, Noah could then 
categorize them, making a catalog, put them inside the ark, making sure they had enough food, the food that they needed, enough, enough, you know, warmth or freshness, whatever they need uh, to basically um, uh, survive. They probably took also uh, reptiles and, and, and amphibies uh, because those they need to be a good percentage of their life on earth on the crust and then some then a lot of the time they go also in the in the water but they cannot survive in the water long time so all of those animals that they live partially on water and partially on dry land they also came into the ark of the clean and unclean but basically the ones who had perfect genetics who were not bre bred with other creatures or crazy stuff and thou shalt go and seat thyself by the doors of the ark, and all the beasts, the animals, and the fowls shall assemble and place themselves before thee, and such of them as shall come and, cr and crutch before thee, shall thou take and deliver into the hands of thy sons, who shall bring them to the ark, and all that will stand before thee, thou shalt leave. So it's very interesting, because in a lot of depictions, they put the animals in the ark as grown, but we know that having adult animals, then it will be a bit difficult because then they have a bit larger size and they might, and they might have uh, situations when they go into heating and so they want to mate. And it's written that Yahweh didn't want animals to mate in the ark to cause too much, um, uh, Base, weight, baggage, and 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 food or uh, scarcity. So he wanted animals to mate outside of the ark. In many uh, in many dystopian movies, when they talk about um, transformation or uh, spaceships going into different worlds uh, to um, to conquer or to colonize different planets and all of that nonsense, they always show a part of the ship with uh, with uh, embryos. Uh, and or or children in 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 um, in static um, um, cryogenic in cryogenic capsules, ready to be then grown fully when the ship attracts to the new to the new world. So here, because he says he's delivering the animals in the hands of his sons, we can then confirm that the animals enter the ark as 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 littles as little as cubs as as as, uh, as basically children quote unquote babies as baby animals you see um and, and again because they stayed 12 months in the ark they had time then to grow in adulthood or near adulthood and then when the time get came to get out um then they could go and uh, multiply in ease. Because imagine the ark we saw the size is, is quite is quite huge, but not huge enough to have full size grown elephant, full size grown giraffes, full size grown um, what else um, hippos, full size grown horses. Full size pigs, full size cows, full size crocodiles. It will take too much space. So, because a crocodile, when he's a, a little, um, it's just a, what, how many inches? Maybe 10 inches? So it is possible that some of the fowls were actually in eggs. So maybe the parents came with the head, with the eggs in, in their little hands, and then deliver the eggs into the the sons of um of Noah hands, and then they were put in in nests to be warm enough to be then when they were born they probably were born in the ark, and then when they came out it was time for uh for reproduction multiplication. So I do believe that some of the the mammals were they came in baby form. And then some reptiles and some fowls to occupy less space, also because birds they need to fly and they they really they 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 thrive if they um if they if they just move around they came probably in egg form they came as embryos. I think it's fantastic if you think about it.
imagine so the arc if you think in this model makes more sense because you're occupying less space is more food um sustainable water sustainable uh, long term because we did discuss that water was probably stored then was also um accumulated in the days with rain but then when the time it was not raining anymore then they probably used the water of the of the of uh, just below them because didn't have much salt because of the amount of water that came down but still to rationate for all the for all the animals and themselves because imagine we're talking about uh, Noah his wife his three children so five people plus the three wives eight people eight eating drinking for 12 months so it's a lot of food and plus all animals had to eat um drink then disposal of of uh, of feces probably they were just throwing it out, you know outboard um and, and all of that to keep the hygiene of the of the place so obviously if you have babies it's like the, i do believe that the noah's ark is makes more sense if it was like a big nursery like they he took plants in form of seeds or small plants that he could then um implant ready uh that they had embryos of of and in the form of eggs of uh, of different uh, animals like frogs uh, birds and reptiles and then had baby baby mammals because then there there is less the threat for aggressivity you see that they don't fight too much um yeah also if you consider the big animals like the a cow or an elephant definitely baby and a baby elephant is still quite a uh, quite a big animal but still more manageable to be transported for 12 months than an, an adult size uh, elephant especially two of them because it is true that the ark was in three stores uh, and it was um uh, quite quite a huge boat at least for that time however having uh, baby animals and eggs of other species definitely can reduce the space very interesting question about the um especially the mammals because uh, Uh, baby animals when they are very very young they are normally fed with only milk and then slowly they eat more solid food etc some uh, they they are grown in just a few weeks other in few months uh, so it depends an elephant to be grown it takes years so definitely tw- in 12 months the the ba- the baby elephant would have not grown to too much anyways both the male and the female So the question about the milk two options either Noah was able to just um um embark uh maybe or one or a couple a couple of cattle for his own personal use however uh, Yawa clearly showed that only baby animals were allowed to enter the ark so we can probably discount this option so because obviously lactation and milk is possible only when a calf um has uh, has just given birth right so uh and obviously it's possible only if the cow, if the if the cow is um uh, is um is an adult just given birth to a calf and so that's why he's lactating second option storing milk but how do you store milk uh, for a long period of times maybe they pass they learned how to pasteurize it maybe yawa um taught them how to do it to preserve the milk for a long time maybe they do t- did the fermentation pasteurization of the milk um um or maybe they even go go as far as making dry milk because dry milk in the modern days was invented by this guy that then made the Nestle factory in uh, in Germany 
But who knows? Maybe in the ancient world, they did know how to make dry milk already. Don't you think it would be so revolutionary if Noah was able to make dry milk, put it into barrels, and then uh, just adding water, and then feeding the animals for 12, you know, for a few months, those who were you know, um, still very young and, and then progressing to solid foods. I think it would be an interesting, um, thing to explore more, in more details. Um, maybe we would find out one day, but if Yawa was helping Noah to survive an entire extermination of, of, of humankind and of all living thing, you would also think that he taught them how to do uh, stocking, preservation, drying of food. Uh, one day I'll make an episode about um, con conservation of food, that you can jar food, dry food, um, uh, you can ferment food. There's so many different options to keep a, a delicate uh, dairy for a long time. Um, why am I thinking about this? Because in the book of uh, second book of Adam and Eve, when they are kicked out from uh, from Eden and they live in the in the wild in the, what we know as the modern world now, uh, they didn't have any clothes and they didn't have any utensils to uh, to hunt or to grow food. So Yahweh had pity on them and he sent angels to teach them how to uh, sew themselves clothes and how to make just basic utensil uh, for a living. Um, so it is possible then uh, that Yahweh, when he was prepping Noah for the end of his world, uh, but because the new world was about to come, that he he probably instructed him like these preppers that they are on the internet with videos about how to prepare uh, for you know for nuclear nuclear explosions, how to make yourself a bunker, and how to uh, store food for a long time. Especially water is probably the one the the most difficult because uh, believe it or not, sometimes with other perishable food is is actually easier than storing water and yeah so it's something to consider because if they were baby animals then it is true that they consumed less food but they needed like fresh milk every day and to be fed by you know him his wife his three sons and his three sons' wives. So it was a, a very big job to feed all these animals, cuddle them, they were scared and everything else. They're very interesting. And so they were just uh, giving them milk. So because babies or little animals, they don't consume as much and they don't need so much different, different, um, uh, different, um, um, food because you can imagine just a cow on his own needs to eat i don't know pounds upon pounds of grass so if you have a baby cow then of course by the time it grows up to to the full length they probably attract attract you know arrive and then the and on dry land but before then they probably just manage with some dry uh, hay or fresh grass because i do believe they created like a small um uh, uh garden on the upper floors um probably um so to, to self-sustain themselves and the, and the animals. Anyways, verse 3. And Yahuwah brought these about on the next day, and the animals, beasts, and fowls came in great multitudes and surrounded the ark. And Noah went and seated himself by the door of the ark, and of all flesh that crushed before him, he brought into the ark, and all that stood before him he left upon earth. So basically, the ones that they were... Um, just standing and and then being um, maybe rude, he left out those that they uh, they instead they crouched and they they showed obedience came in, and a lioness came with her two whelps, male and female. You see, the parents brought their babies 
like I said, and three crouched before Noah. And Noah took the whelps, rose up against the lioness motor, and made her flee from her place. Basically, she couldn't take the mother, only the little puppies, because there was no space for her. Is it is it difficult? Yes, but in all the dystopian movies that you see, there's always this thing, we can only save the children. We need to leave the, um, the adults behind, you know, for a clean start. And she went away, and they returned to their places and crushed upon the earth before Noah. So the lioness was righteous because she had righteous pup puppies. But Noah was told by Yahuwah, no exceptions. Because if you have one, if you have the mother and the two puppies, when they grow up, then the mother can be um, a threat to her daughter because she will want to compete and and have uh, hot springs with her son because he's the only male left of their species. So to avoid, um, uh, you know, uh, competition and violence among within the same species when it's basically just the the beginning they only want couples obviously then when the the uh the animal kingdom multiplies then of course you have lions fighting against lions etc for territory but that is in the normal scheme of life in the normal food chain to maintain homeostasis of the numbers of animals within the same because a lion who can kill a lion? Only another lion because he's the top of the chain in his environment, right? Unless he has an accident or unless he's fighting and losing against the bull. But that's like um, uh, the, the exception of the rule. But te technically, the lion is the one with the equipment to, to beat any other animal within his environment, right? Unless you are putting a lion and a bear, you can put them to fight. I don't know who's going to win. Most likely a bear. I don't know. But bears and lions don't live in the same ecosystem. But within his own ecosystem, the lion is the top guy, the top chain. So to make sure that you don't have too many lions, then you need to put um, a high level of testosterone and competition between males. So then they just kill off each other, right? When there are too many. Right. So, and the lion has run away and stood in the place of the lions. And Noah saw this and wondered greatly, and he rose and took the two whelps and brought them into the ark. And Noah brought into the ark from all living creatures that were upon the earth, so there were, was none left but which Noah brought into the ark. You see, everything that I speculated until now is confirmed. They were taking the babies of the animals because it was more sustainable for the size of the ark. Two and two came to Noah into the ark. Uh, and, but from the clean animals and the clean fowls, he brought seven couples, as Yahuwah had commanded him. And all the animals and beasts and fowls were still there. And they surrounded the ark at every place. <laughs> and the rain had no descended till seven days after. So basically the animals, they, they, they knew that something was going on. So they started surrounding the ark because they were like, why are they taking only the babies and the clean, ba like, uh, clean and unclean babies inside the ark, only in couples, sevens and twos? Um, why are they leaving us behind? What's going on? Because animals, they lost the, uh, the, 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 the talking, uh, after the fall. I read it that I showed you, the animals used to talk to us. Now simply um, we, we lost communication, um, but they, they knew that something was going on. And um, so they were preoccupied. They're like, oh my gosh, they're leaving us to die. Um, and on the day that Yahuwah caused the whole earth to shake, because I mentioned that there was going to be a earthquake, and the sun darkened, and the foundations of the world raged, and the whole earth was moved violently, and the lightning flashed, and the thunder roared, and all the fountains in the earth were broken. Pa! Just pop! All the, basically, the plumbery of the earth literally splashed, broke off. All the inner rivers, uh, creeks, and all of it just splashed. 
Seshas was not known in the in uh, to the inhabitants before because again imagine yes you have a lot of water coming down but also to have a violent uh, pushing of and of all uh, of all unclean uh, creations you had to have tsunamis to push animals and humans inside the sea to be drowned uh, so they didn't have time to f- find shelter or basically to to catch them by surprise because if you had rain coming down and you see the level slowly going up 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 people are very industrial they would have found a way to survive somehow because the the survival instinct is strong to make sure they didn't have time to catch them off guard he th- he made earthquake because you need earthquake and you need the darkening of the sun so the moon comes up to increase the waves you know because the moon is one of the uh, objects that we talked about in the book of Enoch that is regulating the wave length of the sea so if you have darkening of the sun so you have more moonlight then you have the shaking of the earth you are increasing the 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 height of the tsunami of the of the sea waves so we're talking about sea wave big as i don't know one kilometer five kilometers so when a tsunami comes nobody has time to um to prepare it just comes and you you just you just die you just don't know when the the next one why when the next one comes so if you come with repetitive repetitive um natural disasters people don't have time to then secure shelter or organize themselves they just boom that's why they say when the day of yeshua comes people will be still getting married going to work eating and drinking sleeping because it just comes by surprise so people don't have time to prepare um and then the fountains the earth were broken up such was known to inhabitants before yah did this mighty act in order to terrify the sons of men that they were might be no more evil upon the earth and still the sons of men will not return from their evil ways and they increased the anger of Yahweh at that time and did not even direct their hearts to all of this and all the and at the end of the seven days in the 600 year of the life of Noah the waters of the flood were upon your boom all the fountains of the deep were broken up windows of the heaven were open and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights Noah and his household and all the living creatures that were within came into the ark in account of the waters of the flood and Yahweh shut shut him in and all the sons of men that were left upon the earth became exhausted through evil on account of the rain for the waters were coming more violently upon the earth and the animals and the beasts were still surrounding the ark so basically the animals were still there hanging like please take us in and the sons of men assembled together about 700,000, 700,000 men and women, and they came unto Noah to the ark. <laughs> that must have been so scary. Imagine an army of crazy Canaanites, Nephilim like, like you can imagine the barbarians, right? How they looked. That's how they looked. Crazy women and men dressed up with skins with long beards and uh, and probably a a, 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 a gigantic uh, i don't know cow bone cow uh, uh, like a you know femur you know banging on their on their door to get in and they called to noah saying open for us that we may come to the in the ark and wherefore shall we die and Noah, with loud voice, answered from them from the earth, saying, Have you not all rebelled against Yahweh, and that he does not exist? And therefore the Yahweh brought upon you this evil to destroy and cut you off from the, safe of the, from the face of the earth. Yeah, because these people were raging, bad, crazy, doing awful things, and then they want to be saved, right? And they say, they even said that Yahweh didn't exist because they did everything they wanted and nobody was reprimanding them, you see. 
And they said to Noah, We are ready to return to Yahuwah. Only open for us that we may live and not die. Lying. They would have come in, killed them off, and I don't know what, have, what else they would have done. Probably some crazy stuff. And Noah answered them saying, Behold, now that you see the trouble of your souls, you wish to return to Yahuwah. Why did you not return during these, these 120 years? <laughs> good, good question. Obviously, it's rhetorical. Which the Lord um, granted you as determined, period. But now you come and tell me this is on account of the troubles of your souls. And now also the Yahweh will not listen to you, neither will he give you ear to you on this day, so that you will not now succeed in your wishes. And the sons of men approached on in order to break into the ark. You see, they wanted to break by force. To come in on account of the rain, for they could not bear the rain upon them. And Yahuwah sent all the beasts and animals that stood around the ark. You see? Wow! So Yahuwah used them as a, as a, as a trap, as a weapon, last minute a weapon. Wow, Yahuwah is so great. Basically, these animals, at first, they probably hoped to, to be saved, but then... They understood that if the, these men broke into the ark, they would have probably killed their children, like their little baby animals. So to protect the, the future of their baby animals, they started to attack the evil 700,000 men and women to give their offspring future for the for the new world. I think it's it's heartbreaking, so generous. Like this is the ultimate sacrifice when your parents sacrifice their lives to save you, right? So wow. It's just guys, you need to read Apocrypha books. They're amazing. What? This is so beautiful. So Yahuwah had put them as basically as uh, insurance, as security because he knew that people, when they get desperate, they see the only uh, uh, shelter a possible. You see in the dystopia movies, when people see you, that you have a car. In the dystopia movies, they always try to steal your car, kill you. If you have food in your house, they kill you. They, 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 they rape the women inside the house. And, you know, it's just uh, people just go ham, okay, when uh, the end comes. So then he's surrounded the ark with these animals that at first they hope to be saved but then they're like we know that we're gonna die but at least our offspring will have a future so we need to destroy this evil man that's absolutely incredible And the beasts overpowered them and drove them from the place. And every man went his way and they again scattered themselves upon the face of the earth. And the rain was still descending upon the earth. You see, so they basically killed some of them. They were killed. Others, instead, they just ran away to try to find a way to survive. Because, you know, some people are still delusional in those stages. They still think they can make it. Um... And the rain was still descending upon the earth, and it descended forty days and forty nights, and the waters prevailed greatly upon the earth, and all the flesh that was upon the earth or in the waters died. Oh, that's interesting. So a lot of the sea monsters died, but not all of them, though. Whether men, animals, bees, creeping things, or birds of, of the air, and there only remained Noah and those that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed, and they greatly increased upon the earth, and they lifted up the ark, and it was raised from the earth. And the ark floated upon the face of the waters, and it was tossed upon the water, so that all the living creatures within were turned about like pottage in a cauldron. <laughs> this is so cute, but it's not. So basically, these little baby animals were shaken up in this boat <laughs> from the waves. <laughs> And great anxiety sees all the living creatures that were in the ark, and the ark was like the like to be broken. And all the living creatures that were in the ark were terrified, and the lions roared, and the oxen loud, and the wolves howled, um, howled, and every living creature in the ark spoke and lamented in its own language. So their voices reached a great distance, and Noah on, and his sons cried and wept. 
in, the, in their troubles, they were greatly afraid that they had reached the gates of death. Well, guys, if Yahuwah had done all of this, do you think you guys would have died? But yeah, in those situations, you're stressed, so you think you're not going to make it. So imagine these baby animals, they were shaken up from one side to the, the other in the boat. <laughs> they didn't have their mom or their dad consoling them because they were babies inside the ark. And so they were just like probably trying to hug upon each other, shaking in fear on the corners of their little, of their little, you know, section. Poor little thing. You know, they were probably just, <laughs> oh. This day, I, I hope they hug them and cuddle them. Poor things. Oh, dear. And Noah prayed unto Yahuwah and cried unto him on account of this. And he said, O oh, Yahuwah, help us, for we have no strength to bear this evil that has encompassed us. For the waves of the waters have surrounded us. Mischievous torrents have terrified us. The snares of death have come before us. Answer us, O oh, Yahuwah, answer us. Light up the continents toward us and, gracious, and, and be gracious to us. Redeem us and deliver us. And Yahuwah hearkened to the voice of Noah, and Yahuwah remembered him. Because, of course, he's a busy guy, so and so, I think that he also wanted to put them to the test. You know, he didn't want them to have a cruise um, experience. He wanted them to feel that they were saved just by, by the... Um, but by grace, that other people were going through it worse than them. Because if they were saved and they were breathing across, having like cocktails, mojitos by, by the, you know, um, uh, by the top of the ark and taking sunscreen and sun, sunbathe, you know, sunbathing, etc., they would have thought, oh, okay, well, everything is cool. So they would have not appreciated the, they, they were saved. So a lot of the times these journeys of salvations, they're also terrifying. Uh, so you're more appreciative that you are saved and it's very cathartic in a way, you know. Um, and a wind passed over the earth and the waters were still and the ark rested. And the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven were restrained because there are gates where Yahweh keeps the wind and then they are open, depending on what he wants to do. And so decided, okay, I'm going to put the, some stop to these, um, to this, um, uh, storm so they can just, uh, you know, rest a little bit. And the waters decreased in those days and the ark rested upon the mountains of Hararat. And Noah then opened the windows of the ark and Noah still called out to Yahuwah at that time and said, "O oh, Yahuwah, who did this uh, for uh, form the earth and the heavens and all that are uh, therein? Bring forth our souls from this confin confinement and from the prison where Thou has placed us, for I am much weird uh, with the with uh, singing." And Yahuwah hearkened to the voice of Noah and said to him, When thou shalt have completed a full year, thou shalt then go forth. And at the revolution of the year, when a full year was completed to Noah's dwelling in the ark, the waters were dried from off the earth, and Noah put off the covering of the ark. At that time, on the twentieth seventh day of the second month, the earth was dry. But Noah and his sons and those that were within did not go out from the ark until Yahweh told them. He said they were very obedient. Even though it was dry, they waited. And they, they came, the Yahweh told them to go out, and they all went out from the ark. And they went and returned everyone uh, to his way and to his place. And Noah and his sons dwelt in the land of Yahuwah had told them. And they served Yahuwah all their days. And Yahuwah blessed Noah and his sons on their going out from the ark. And he said to them, Be fruitful and fill all the earth. Become strong and increase abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. So this was chapter 6 and it was beautiful. Well, let's go into Genesis 8 to just read uh, whoa, whoa, what's happening there. Basically, it's the same situation here, but just less um, dramatic. Like, <laughs> no, it's, it's still dramatic, but 
they didn't put so much um um <laughs> special effect on the on the babies crying and you know the animal babies i mean and um the fight with the um, with the last remaining men who wanted to break in and the beasts, etc. Because in the movie of Noah, you can tell they didn't just use the Bible to, for, for the script. It's very clear that they read Jasher. Because in the book, there is this uh, guy who is an um, evil Canaanite who managed to break into the, into the ark and wants to kill Noah and, the, and his sons and have the women as his um, slaves and his sex slaves to repopulate the earth on his, in, his, in his image to basically, uh, basically bring about the same evilness as it was before. But then this man is killed. So they did use um, the this basically this episode of this man who wanted to break into the ark to take it from them for themselves to survive, right? Not knowing that if if they managed, which they wouldn't, because Yahweh had a plan. Yahweh would have killed them all anyways. Do you think that 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 piece of wood? could have, uh, you know, uh, managed if Yahuwah was unleashing the worst storm uh, that mankind has ever seen. There are a lot of stories of uh, ships who went sinking uh, during storms, who had uh, similar equipment, if not better. Um, so even the Titanic was one of the best boats ever built, was went sinking. So what do you think about the, <laughs> the little <laughs> Noah's boat? I mean, that was put together with the will of Yahweh, I am telling you. So anytime you think that your projects are taking too long or you're discouraged, think about Noah. They had to build an ark in secrecy with his sons, hiding from from the, the, the Canaanites um, uh, to make sure that he could save his family and uh, the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. Imagine that. Because he didn't ask him too many questions because when he was walking around, he looked like a son of Nephilim simply because he had pale skins and red eyes. Because they, he was the first albino of his kind. So Satan didn't know that he was an albino because he never saw albinism before in the, um, in the, in the black bloodline, you see. So Genesis 8, and Yahweh remembered Noah and every living thing, and all the cattle that was with him and the ark. And Yahweh made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters uh, assuaged. And the fountains also of the deep, on the, and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven were, was restrained. And the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of the hundred and fifty days, the waters were abated. And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventh day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually, until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, were, stop, were the tops of the mountains seen. And it came to pass, at the end of the forty days, that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made. And he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro, until the waters were dried up from uh, of the earth. And also he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her feet, and she returned unto the, um, into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the earth. Um, th uh, then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. Then he stayed yet other seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came in to him in the evening, and in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off, so Noah knew the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet other seven days, and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. Because remember he said that he wanted to wait for Yahweh's signal to know when it was time for him to go out. So the dove was the symbol for him to go out when he, she never returned because she just uh, made herself shelter. So no one knew that it was dry enough for him to leave on. So the first was a raven. And you know the raven is a blackbird. Then 
he went for the dove, the dove, the symbols of uh, hope, purity, and uh, and um, a resurrection or like a second life, because this was for them a second life. It was a new earth, a new world for them to to procreate on. Um, And in the second month of the seventh and twenty day of the month was the earth dried. And Yahweh spoke unto Noah, saying, Go forth to the, of the ark, thou and thy wife, and thy sons, and thou sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee, of flesh, both of fowl and cattle, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth, and be fruitful, and multiply upon the earth. Noah went forth, and his sons, and his wife, and his son's wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kinds, went forth out of the ark. And Noah built an altar unto Yahuwah, took of every clean beast, and every clean fowl, and, ev and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And Yahuwah smelled a sweet savor, and Yahuwah said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for men's sake, for the imagination of men's heart is evil from his youth. <laughs> we can agree on that. Neither will I ga again smite any more everything living as I have done. So basically it's like I'm not going to make um, animals pay for uh for mankind sin again he had to do it simply because a lot of the animals were mixed with uh, nephilim blood however from now on he said only the man will uh, will pay while the earth remaineth seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease so everything should go on as normal seasons plants you know Anyone, anything else can be destroyed, but the, the order of things shall remain as as he as he was. He doesn't want to uh, cause any further problems, and I I, I agree. It's, it's a good um, it's a good thing because why should they um, they pay for for our sins, poor things? We can all agree on that at least. Okay, let's see what's happening. Um, so let's read um, Jubilees chapter 6. Jubilee, which is this book that was written after basically the death of Moses. Um, so it should be probably just after numbers. It was in the Bible before, you know, after numbers. So. And on the new moon of the third month, he went forth from the ark and built an altar on the mountain, the same that we saw in Genesis 8. And he made atonement for the earth and took a kid and made atonement by its blood for all the guilt of the earth. Thing, yeah, is the baby of a goat. Yeah, you see, because the lamb is the baby of the ship, sorry. So the kid is the baby of the goat. <laughs> you know, sometimes I have to remind me, because I knew it was the baby of an animal, but I didn't remember which one. Okay, for everything that had been on uh, on it had been destroyed, save those that were in the ark with Noah. So basically, to come to agreement with Yahweh, he also brought atonement. Um, so as soon as these animals multiplied, the first kid of the goats that he saved, yeah, he sacrificed it for Yahuwah for, for, uh, for their salvation. And he placed the fat thereof on the altar, and he took an ox and a goat and a sheep and kids and salt and turtle dove. Uh, and the young of the dove, and place a burnt sacrifice on the altar, and pour thereon an offering mingled with oil and sprinkled wine, and struck uh, frankincense, franken frankincense, sorry, over everything, and cause a godly savor to arise acceptable before Yahweh, because in Greek mythology, because Greeks they always try to steal. Uh, information from from Torah and Tanakh. In um, in Greek mythology, they need to uh, they need to make um, offerings to Zeus in the form of savory um, um, uh, 
spices and fat because Zeus only accepts uh, fat offerings because the Greeks were basically stealing this idea from Yahweh because obviously Zeus is the um, is the um, one of the names of, of of the enemy because you know that the enemy and his friends they depict themselves as gods like in different religion they have different names so basically to mock Yahuwah they ask humankind to make uh, fat sacrifices to them pretending to be the Almighty yeah what can you do and Yahweh smelled the good, godly, uh, uh, sorry, the goodly savor, and he made a covenant with him that there should not be any more a flood to destroy the earth, that all the days of the earth, seed time and harvest should never cease, cold and heat and summer and winter. You see the same thing that we saw in Genesis 8. And day and night should not change their order, nor cease forever. And you increase ye, and multiply upon the earth, and become many upon it, and be blessing upon it. The fear of you, and the dr dread of you, I will dis inspire in everything that is on earth, and I will, and, and in the sea. And behold, I have given unto you all the beasts, and all wing, winged things, and everything that moveth on the earth, and, that, and the fish in the waters, and all the things for food. As the green herbs, I have given you all things to eat. But flesh, with the life thereof, with the blood, you shall not eat. For the life of, fl of all flesh is in the blood, lest your blood of your lives be required. At the end of every man, and at the end of every beast, I will require the blood of men. So that's why man is some, sometimes hated by animals because it's a contract because when Adam lost grace because at first the animals were serving Adam they were talking to him like friends they never attacked humans then they started attacking humans when uh, Adam left uh, Eden and and so um, even now animals can attack humans um, based on this on this on this principle you're not supposed to drink the blood because there is soul in the in the so that's why you need to have a um, specific way on how you drain the blood of an animal you need to uh, kill the animal with them um, uh, with dignity and you know in some places they call it kosher other places they call it Alal type of thing because again Muslim religion came about literally yesterday a lot of the things they just took it from Torah and then they made their own book it's fine it's their own culture whatever but they they act like they're they 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 are old in this but they're brand new all of these things they took it from from Torah uh, how to kill the animal with dignity how to drain the blood they learned it from from the original people. Because Mohammed, what was his name, came about literally, what, 800 B.C. after Christ? So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like brand new. <laughs> they, they were not there when Abraham was talking to, to Yahuwah like he was his friend. They were not there when Jacob was fighting with Yahuwah at Penuel. They were not there when Joseph saved his uh, family from famine. Anyways, <sighs> okay, so who's shed in man's blood by man shall his blood be shed? For in the image of Yahuwah made he man. So basically, if you if you if you um, killed by the sword, you died by the sword, you know, because um, when you are killing someone, you are attacking Yahuwah's temple. There are exceptions, like if you are defending yourself, or if you are always asking uh, the people to avenge a particular person, or if they are defending themselves as a nation for war purposes. But murder is basically when you are killing someone for frivolous or, or your own intent, so it's not self-defense, it's not that you are uh, avenging, I don't know, the murder or the rape of someone, you're just killing someone for frivolous reasons, 
that they are not the one I just mentioned, then you will pay the price for it. And you increase he and multiply on earth, and Noah and his sons swore, swore that they would not eat any blood that was in any flesh, and he made a covenant before Yahuwah forever throughout all generation of earth in this month. So if Yahuwah made his people to promise to never eat blood, automatically, those who pray Satan, they need to drink blood, simply because you are what told not to. For disobedience, per, first one. Second, because it's also there are um, complications, so there are side effects in drinking blood, because it's altering your your length, your um, lifespan. But So you can live longer, but then it means that you... Are, are chained from drinking blood. You need to continue drinking blood till you, till you die. You can't stop. It's like the drug that you can't stop. There is no, there is no uh, rehab for that. Once you drink blood, it's over for you. On this account he spake to thee that thou shalt make a covenant with the children of Israel in this month upon the mountain with an oath that thou shalt Shouldn't thou shalt sprinkle blood upon them because of all the words of the covenant which Yahweh made with them forever? It's like um, basically when he says the blood of Yeshua covers you. In this time, yeah, they had to do it physically, but now it's spiritually. So you're not sprinkling anybody's goat blood on anybody. And this is testimony is written concerning you that you should observe it continually, so that you should not eat on any day any blood of beasts, bir birds, cattle, during all the days of the earth. And the man who eats the blood of beasts, or cattle, or, or birds, during all the days of the earth, he and his seed shall be rooted out of the land. And do thou command the children of Israel, obviously here they call it children of Israel, because it's written, when I said it was written after numbers, it was removed in the Bible, because the the nation of Israel was already established when this book was written. So, just so you are aware. Um. <sighs> and did not eat blood. So their names and their seed may be before Yahuwah and or on our our Elohim continually. And for this law, there is no limit of days, for it is forever. They shall observe it throughout their generation, so that they may continue supplicating on your behalf with blood before the altar. Every day and at, at that time of morning and every, every and evening, they shall seek forgiveness on your behalf perpetually before Yahuwah, that they may keep it and not be rooted out. And he gave to Noah and his sons a sign there should not again be a flood on the earth. He set his bow in the cloud for a sign for of the eternal covenant that there should not again be a flood on the earth to destroy it in all the days of the earth. For this reason is ordained and written on the heavenly tablets that they should sublate the feast of weeks in this month once a year to renew the covenant every year. And this whole feast festival celebrated in heaven for from the day of creation till the days of Noah, twenty six jubilees and five weeks of years. And Noah and his sons observed it for seven jubilees and one week of years, till the day of Noah's death. And from the day of Noah's death, his sons did away with it until the days of Abraham, and they eat blood. But Abraham observed it, and Isaac and Jacob and his children observed it upon thy days. And in the days, thy days, the children of Israel forgot it until he celebrated anew on this mountain. And do thou command the children of Israel to observe this festival in all their generations for a commandment unto them. One day in a year, in, in this month, they shall celebrate the festival. For in the Feast of Weeks and the Feast of fr First Fruits, this feast is two, uh, twofold and of a double nature, according to, to what is written and engraved concerning it. Celebrate it. For I have written in the book of the first law, and that which I have written for thee, that, shall, that, um, that thou shalt celebrate it in its season, one day in the year. And I explain thee its sacrifices that the children of Israel should remember and should celebrate it throughout their generation in this month, one day in every year.
in the new moon of the first month, and on the new moon of the fourth month, and on the new moon of the seventh month, and on the new moon of the tenth month, are days of remembrance, and the days of the seasons in the four divisions of the year. These are the written and ordained as testimony forever. So it's very beautiful because it said, look, I'm sanctifying this and I'm making sure I'm not going to be destroying earth by, by water anymore. By water. It didn't say he's not going to destroy it ever by fire or other things. Um, and then you need to celebrate. Obviously, he's talking about the rainbow. And now... In the in the modern days, because we are in the days as Noah, people are um, uh, are basically defiling themselves with uh, evil practices like uh, sexual depravity and all of that, and they took the rainbow symbol and make it a mockery for the LGBTQ B whatever community. So. They took away what was a symbol of of of, of purity between Yahuwah and mankind, and made and made it the symbol of the most filthy movement they ever made. Now, children, they cannot even make a beautiful rainbow with ponies on a on a on a nice drawing for their mom because it looks like it's a gay painting. How could they be so evil in taking something so pure and beautiful like a rainbow and make it? the symbol of the most defiled acts, using intestine and rectum for sexual, re for, for sexual activities, that is filled up with, with, um, with, with feces, right? Epidemies of, um, of, of, uh, of a teeth infection, because people um, entertain oral activities of some sorts that I don't need to go into details. Men and women going within themselves, with animals, with, 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 with minors, with children. It's just so disgusting. Disgusting. And they call it love. Marriage is an institution created by Yahuwah. If you don't believe in Yahuwah, or if you entertain these practices, why do you want to get married? This is an institution that doesn't apply to you. Why do you want to be married? For what? You're a pagan. It's, it's wicked. It's absolutely wicked. What they do. Since pure insanity, man. So, the very interesting part about this festival of the bow the festival of rainbow. The children of Israel, the Ibrim people, are supposed to celebrate it every year. Then the first generation, until Abraham, they forgot. Then with Abraham, they institute again with Jacob and all his descendants. But then they will forget until in the last days they will remember who they are and celebrate the, uh, the, ra the rainbow festival. Uh, among themselves. The disgusting thing is that the Satanist it took the, the rainbow that is our symbol, they took it for themselves and what they do every year, they celebrate gay pride. You cannot make the stuff up. It's written here in Jubilee 6. This uh, festival was supposed to be for the children of Israel to celebrate the the covenant with Yahuwah and the forgiveness of sins and that, that he will not destroy the earth the way he did before. They, we will start from fresh and the Satanists, instead what they did, they took the rainbow and they made it the symbol that is the opposite of what it's supposed to be. The rainbow now is symbol of depravity, pedophilia homosexuality the, the 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 destruction of of everything that is clean and pure family honor nation you see how the devil works he takes everything that is that is uh, meaningful to us and makes it for himself
So this festival was supposed to be when the spring comes, the, 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 the rainbow festival of the children of Israel. So we're talking probably March, April. Basically, they substitute that with Easter. Because Easter is a Ishtar religion. It's basically the celebration of the goddess of fertility. It has nothing to do with the death of Yeshua, resurrection, all of that. Because we will, when we see when he dies, we will see if he died in a different month of the year. The same way the, 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 he was not born in December, he was most likely born in September. We will look at it when we talk about Yeshua specifically, because this is probably, probably the best part about this journey that we're doing together is reaching Yeshua. And so, so upon first um, checking, it is possible that the uh, Rainbow Festival was maybe around April and they substituted with the pagan Ishtar. However, in the text, we can see that there are clues about the, the, the month, or at least the season. It says when the fruits are coming out, and we know the fruits come after spring, so they come in summer. Because first you have germination in the spring, like uh, March, April, and then you start to have um, the bringing forth of fruit around June, July. And most importantly, the, the, the time of the year with the most uh, um, appearance, let's say, of, um, of rainbows is June. Uh, because um, June uh, is sunny, but also has quite, a, uh, quite still a lot of rain. So based on the fact that the fruits are coming forth and uh, and uh, rainbows are most uh, frequent in June, uh, frequent in summer, I think is uh, is about June because there is precipitation and sun in an equal amount that will then make uh, the the waves of light um, then reflect and make uh, the colors of the rainbow that we are so accustomed to now. And then he says that there are other celebration, uh, other feasts that we need to um, uh, that we need to basically celebrate, um, like the first month of the year on the new moon, then on the new moon of the fourth year, then on the new moon of the seventh, and on the new moon of the Tenth, the Ibrim calendar, or for people that are not aware, the Hebrew calendar has twelve months, thirty days um, each month, four seasons. So no uh, discrepancies there, and uh, each month um, had also uh, a specific patriarch. Um, or um, chief that was um, looking after certain duties depending on what would needed to be done um, to make sure that every everything was uh, always on point in terms of regulations, uh, harvesting, etc. Interestingly, they had the same calendar also um, some other nations, even across the ocean, like the Aztecans, like pre-Columbian um, uh, civilizations. However, when it comes to the Romans, they used to have only 10 months, and then they added two. So that's why the 10th month, tenth month for the Roman calendar, which is also the modern calendar that we use today, doesn't coincide with the 10th month of the Hebrew calendar. Because the first, the first month of the year in the Hebrew calendar was the, the, the month where you had germination. So basically after winter, then uh, the, the leaves come back and you have flowers blossoming. So basically the beginning of the year was end of March, beginning of April, mostly beginning of April. So 
that's when the year started in April, while for the Romans, April was the fourth month, at least for um for the normal uh, for the modern gregorian uh, calendar it could be that uh, in the transition time maybe those times were were uh, uh, overlapping it's hard to say because december is still uh, called december as the 10th month even though is then calculated as the 12th so when the Romans added the two extra months, they they still maintain the same the same names, but then distributed it differently. We know that in December they are Saturnalias, uh, festivities of orgies, and that now in modern times they call Christmas because Christmas has nothing to do with the birth of Yeshua. I hope everybody knows. Same way with Easter has nothing to do with the resurrection. Is a pagan. Um, a festivity about fertility. That's why there are Easter eggs and bunnies, and because obviously rabbits are very fertile. They can make 10, 12 little rabbits in just one pregnancy. And eggs is the same because uh, chickens, they can uh, obviously lay a lot of eggs. And so all those are symbols of fertility for both a bird and a mammal. And so then they summarize them into the bunny that goes hunting eggs you see just to make it more um compressed as an idea <clears throat> but we'll probably look at these festivities and calendar another time because i do believe it's so interesting uh, because astrology the um positioning of the stars is decided by yahua so yahua um, at first, when he gave the timing and the festivities to the people, he knew he w we would have forgot about the festivities, and then there would would have been a disruption of the of the year, the calculation, because if you celebrate a uh, uh, um, uh, Hebrew festivity in the wrong day, then it becomes unclean. You need to celebrate it in a specific time of the year, in a specific time day season everything so the best thing is to abstain to celebrate any festivity because it is very unlikely that you are celebrating anuka or palms or resurrection in the right time absolutely not even uh the um, eastern european jews that they have a certain um uh, celebration uh, uh, around the calendar they might be wrong um, because again it is written here that uh, the calendar would have been disrupted and we will forget so no one really knows when is the right time for passover uh, hanukkah all of those things it is very difficult based on this fact and then you will think why don't we just um, use astrology or cosmology to find the right uh, track you can't because um you can be easily mistaken and also because it's a very th thin line in between um astronomy which is this you're just studying positioning of the stars and astrology which is basically the witchcraft of the divination of the stars because then you get enticed into trying to find the future and trying to understand um things using um unholy methods so based on this fact the calendar that we use today has been changed at least like i don't know three four times so it's it's impossible for anyone to really find the the exact the exact month forget about the exact date you're even lucky if you find the right season honestly um so yeah i i do believe just based on what we read rainbow festival might have might be in june but again who knows if our june is the correct june we don't know because the calendar has been changed in the numbering, in the in the sequencing, and everything, so you cannot get it, you know take it for for granted. The most disgusting layer on this um, 
on this Pride Month situation is not only they stole the rainbow concept, but they are celebrating Pride Month in um, basically in the same month that most likely was the original rainbow um, Abrahamic celebration. Because the Pride Month of this um, the battery of a community is celebrated in June. The same way the 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 Noah would have were, would have uh, proclaimed the glory for Yahweh for saving them from the flood, sparing them from destruction because the rest of the world was defiled. So you can imagine that these people have purposefully took the flag made it the symbol of of uh, sexual perversion and to celebrate it in the same month that Noah and our patriarchs used to celebrate the glory of Yahweh and the cleansing of, of, of humanity. How twisted it is. It's absolutely twisted, insane, kind of sadistic at this point. We will definitely talk more about the um, uh, the debauchery and sexual perversion when we go and analyze Sodom and Gomorrah. However, this was very important to understand um, the why the LGBT community has LGBTQP <laughs> community has um, decided to to basically rob um, the righteous uh, side of mankind of the rainbow. They robbed us of a symbol that was basically a covenant between us and Yahuwah to never do what what was done before the flood, the the breeding, the the, the bestiality, the sexual perversion, the violence, the rape. However, in the modern days, as it was prophesied in the Revelation, it shall be like the, the days of Noah. So they are mocking us, saying, look, even though Yahuwah has sent the flood, yet we are still here. We are still doing what we want. They are rubbing their perversion in our face, but mostly on Yahuwah's face, just because they are not. Uh, punished as they were before, but Yahweh is always very patient. He allows us a few centuries, even a thousand years to repent, and then he's going to come with the sword this time, and, and he's going to cleanse with fire, no more with water, with fire. And we will take the rainbow back, and we will uh, send them to the lake of fire, those reprobates. And and yeah, so don't be discouraged uh, when you see the rainbow. They used to be a symbol of hope, a symbol of purity, and now is a symbol of 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 uh, of darkness. Um, they do it on purpose, just to um, take away the joy out of, out of life. But they will not succeed. And to mock Yahweh even further, they celebrate pride in the same month that our our patriarchs used to celebrate um the 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 you know the the post flood um festival the rainbow festival so it's just incredible what the length that they will go just to um um just to defile uh the promise because anyone that defiles you know the body defiles Yahuwah because each human body is a temple that you're not supposed to defile with those practices and genetic manipulation and so many other things. However, now that we have clarified this um, evil festival and and that we put like a separation between the evil festival versus the righteous festival um, that it used to be um, uh, 
you know, before, um, before humankind decided to go back to his horrible ways. Um, I think it's a good opportunity to just have a reflection on something very important that we haven't really discussed. Um, is that Noah, when the land was dried up, he sent the dove, you know, a couple of times, and then the dove never returned because um, obviously the, the earth was dry enough for the dove to just find shelter on her own. Noah attracted, or actually <laughs> just the... Uh, just l not landed even just um just uh, arrived uh, on the on the top of the mountain called Ararat obviously because the 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 entire world was covered in water so it was obvious that when he was then um able to leave in on the normal on the normal, uh, basically in the normal uh, <laughs> environment, you know, dried environment, he would have probably just attracted on a mountain, right? Because then when the levels of the water decrease, then they realize, oh, wow, we are on top of a mountain and we need to descend. Where is this mountain located? Well, this mountain is located in Turkey. So they're both from what we can think about uh, between the Tigris and Euphrates area. That's the area where Adam and Eve uh, were uh, living in the Garden of Eden. And then they, when they were kicked out, they just remained quite close to the what was Eden back then. And then their their sons and daughters multiplied in the in the region um uh, addition to that however the the boat through the current and the storm arrived all the way to turkey so it's a big big voyage of around 1300 uh, kilometers um from i just put an example of mount ermen in Israel, which is very key because uh, there are so many biblical histories about um, uh, Mount Ermen. So to, these two mountains are 1,300 kilometers apart, a huge, huge distance uh, to think about, especially for those times. And you will say, how the, do they then manage to go back? Well, it took them few generations. That's why there is this journey of Abraham first and then Jacob. Why? Because think about it for a second. They were at first in the, near the Tigri and Euphrates, right, region. Okay. So, nearby modern-day Iraq. So, very close to the uh, the promised land, right? However, because of the flood, they were, they were pushed away so further up that it took them generations to generations to go then to the promised land. So, now everything makes a lot of sense of why it was it took so long uh, from Abraham to Isaac to Isaac to Jacob to arrive until there, because there were no roads back then. You didn't have GPS. There were no instructions. Plus, they were they had to um, uh, travel with like um, like a uh, maybe a, a caravan or something, or with just cattle, and it takes a long time. Plus, with children. Um so every few months, years, they were just pushing further and further to go back home. So it wasn't immediate. Now that you see it in the map, you understand why. It took so long from Noah to Abraham to even reach Midian. 
territory. And then from Abram to Jacob to arrive all the way back to Israel, it takes a lot of effort. So imagine the journey that Sabusese had to do. Imagine, imagine how, how, cause the, that journey is like four times larger, you know? Imagine. That puts a lot of things in perspective because I do think a lot of the times the Bible needs to be looked at in so many different angles from historical, poetic, but also from a geographical point to see where people are going and where people are. And I think it's just mesmerizing. <laughs> they were sent all the way to Turkey and then they had to take uh, and, and, and come back. Uh, so it wasn't immediate and it wasn't easy at all. Definitely they couldn't ask for, uh, for, uh, for help to the, uh, the people around because, uh, they could have been killed off because th those times everything was uh, very dangerous. So imagine the wilderness, imagine the threat, imagine the fear. But Yahweh is always with us. So, um, the Bible is a book of war, is a book of hope, but it's also a journey of these people are always on the move. They're always on the move. They never stand still. Uh, there is always something that push them at one place, the other, captivity, famine, war. They never stand still because moving is life. You're moving like water moves. It's um, it's natural that you're not keeping yourself anchored to a place. You need to be attached to your people, never to a place where you live. So now you understand why the Watusi can live anywhere and was scattered around because our strength is in our people. Our connection is in the blood. It's never on the land because Yahuwah always promised us a land. It doesn't matter where we, where it is. I mean, look, Noah was a righteous man. It was sent to Turkey. Then his sons were sent to Midian. Then even Yeshua was sent to Egypt for a long for a long time during his infancy. When you are Ibrim, you're not attached to land. The land means nothing. It's just a, a resource for food. For, um, uh, for a, for a shelter. However, you can rebuild anywhere. You can prosper anywhere. The, but you cannot, uh, um, substitute, uh, your kindred. That is what is special. Gohim are attached to land. They, they live for the land. They die for the land. I bring people, they fight for their people. We don't die for her, for her, for our country or for a piece of land. It's stupid. You fight for your people. That's what we do. That's why we are always on, on the fight because we are always attacked. And this is maybe an explanation about a lot of things. So thank you so much for, you know, tuning in on this, um, a series about Noah. We will then continue about Noah's generations. We'll see his children, actually his sons grown up. Uh, we will then look in more details about the curse of Ham and all of that. Uh, thank you so much again for your attention. Like and subscribe, share if you care, and I'll see you next time. Ciao, ciao.